If you have or suspect you may have a health problem, or if you require answers to specific health care questions or concerns, you should consult your physician or health care provider and not depend solely on information presented in this program. First, Ask the Doctor live on the road, and thank you for coming out on a cold day for this. We're going to get to answer your questions on the many different health topics. We'll be talking about vascular surgery, geriatrics, and internal medicine. We have Dr. Katsina, Dr. Bakdash, and Dr. Zaman, who are going to be answering the questions. And um, we'll go through, this will be our typical show with a trivia, with in the news, and then we'll get to your questions. There could be one cancer cell in a billion normal cells. It picks up that one cancer cell. It's not working. And then, with this, you can now tell the tumor is spread. You can also develop treatments specific to the tumor, because you're looking at the cell, you're looking at the tumor cell. And you can also see if your therapy is working. So now, if you have a tumor and you get radiated and chemotherapy, you have to follow it up with CAT scans in a month or two, you don't know. Here you can get an instantaneous evaluation of whether it's working. It's going to be used in trials at Sloan Kettering and three other hospital centers across the country starting this April. So we're not that far away. It's probably two to three years away for getting into the mainstream. But right now it's at those hospitals, the major cancer centers. Properly, this is a real threat. You know, to do it, which is the flu that are transmitted very easily. Most of, most of the bad things. So it's a good idea to, to use that. But it just shows now there's recalls. People are getting vaccines, gamma globulin shots which will protect them 100%, but it's unpleasant to have to go, you know, through that. Okay. Now, we have a trivia question of the week, and whoever gets that question gets a beautiful plaque. Many people vying for Have anybody seen that plaque? No. It's a beautiful plaque, handmade in Japan, okay? So it's the top quality stuff, and you're going to love this thing. Now, I, I haven't figured out how to do it here. We'll take by raising the hand. We're going to talk about trivia, something that happened six, uh, 50 years ago on December 16th in Park Slope. Anybody remember? The plane crash, the plane crash in Park Slope. Do you remember? It was, um, it, it was, which airlines was it? Anybody remember the airlines? United. It was United that flew into the yeah, Park Slope? Place. Sterling Place. And what? 7th Avenue. 7th Avenue. And which was the, this is not the question yet. Now, the other plane landed in uh, Staten Island in an army base, the TWA plane. It was the greatest tra trauma, the greatest crash at that up until that time in U.S. history. First time the black box was used to try and work up a, um, a plane crash. The question I have for the trivia question is, when it flew into a building at 123 Sterling Place, this was a church, does anybody know the name of that church that was destroyed by the plane? And the name is kind of ironic. Is it Methodist? Methodist Excuse me, can you, can you repeat that one more time? The no, 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 no. Okay. Look for another one. No? 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 Okay, so we have to give some hints. Okay? Okay, the um, in the name is something that if you put your finger in, you're going to get burned. Fire. No? Fire is part of it. It's got two words in front of it. Something of fire. No. These might be big, tall things in front of a, of a pillar of fire. Yeah, that was the pillar of fire church was totally destroyed. And there's a remnant. The man who, who lives there now found a little piece from the church, Rhode Island, and it's, it's still up there if you want to go and take a look. But that was a tragedy because I don't know. They brought one of the kids who survived, the one surviving person, to Methodist Hospital. And he died the next day. And the reason he, they weren't looking, he had inhaled heat. He had smoked uh, gasoline inhalation, which they didn't realize. Yeah. They didn't give him the, 
nobody would have known at the time, but they could have intubated him, and maybe would have done better, maybe not. But it's interesting that they also learned how to treat subsequent crash victims mm -hmm. from that event. So it's kind of interesting. It's a tragic event. Was anybody there that day? Anybody remember it? No. They're still? We watched it from my grandmother's window on 2nd Street. Wow. Amazing. The fire that was, right? It was a tremendous fire there. So who got pillar of fire? Okay, we're going to get you, you're going to get, we're going to get your name right after the show. And you, do you, have you thought about where you're going to put it? No. He's thinking, it's, you got you to take your time with this type of thing. Okay, what we're going to do is we're going to take a little break now, because we're filming this for the show. And when we come back, we're going to meet our, I think one doctor got offended already. We started too late, I don't know. But we'll meet our three, three doctors, and um, we'll be right back, okay? Okay. Thanks. I'm Dr. Steve Garner, the host of Ask the Doctor. In addition to watching Ask the Doctor every Tuesday night at 8, you can also visit www.netny.net slash askthedoctor. There you can find the topics and guests of each episode. You can read my column from the week for the tablet, and for more advice, you can watch episodes you've missed. More importantly, you can post your questions and I'll answer them on the video blog. So visit www.netny.net slash doctor and get your daily dose of healthy advice. Welcome back, welcome back. <laughs> See, now we didn't have to watch the commercials. Pretty good. Yeah. So I want you to meet the doctors that are here today. I think you're no strangers. Dr. Backhash. Hi. Dr. Nina Backhash. He's a geriatrics and internal medicine. Both. Yes. And he's also the president of our medical staff at New York Methodist Hospital, which is a major position. He usually has a lot of headaches, but he's helped to bring people yeah. together in an amazing way. So I just, yeah. here, Amy, you want to just say hello to the group? Uh, sure. Thanks uh, for inviting me. I'm hap very happy to be here. Um, it's great that you've chosen Church of the Virgin Mary in Brooklyn, New York, to do your first live show. I think that was a great choice, and you know, yeah, well, we're all I great fans of you. And uh, thank, thank you thank very you. much. Thanks. Thank you. See, this is a high budget show. We have one mic. So if this goes, we're in trouble. So just pray for this mic, please. Okay. Now, Dr. Katsina, who's actually, see, this is a live TV. She's getting a consult from the resident or patient? Yes. Yeah, I got, I got one before my wife said bring home the eggs. So that was mine. But here, yeah, Dr. Katsina, you want to say? Say hello? Uh, yes, hi. Hi. Uh, I'm Dr. Katsina. I'm working at Methodist Hospital. Um, I'm the internist and a geriatrician. And uh, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. And geriatrics is very important because just as you wouldn't take your child to an internist dealing with the older people's problems, you want to have somebody who knows where the problems are, who won't overtreat. A lot of times, these things, the average um, person over the age of 65 has like nine medications to take, and probably doesn't need a lot of them duplicate. So it's very important to go to the right doctor. And I have at the end of the table Dr. Ellie Eli Zaman who is a vascular surgeon. And this is, um, you've heard of bypass and aneurysms, and he, he deals with all that complicated stuff. And he's at New York Methodist Hospital, excellent position. I want to, to say a few words. He's also at our uh, Hi, my name is uh, Elisa Mann, for those of you can, that can pronounce it. Um, but uh, my secretary's call me Eli. <laughs> Um, uh, we recently have uh, had a few new things at New York uh, Methodist Hospital. One is the establishment of our aortic center, and uh, one of the things that... Can you uh, tell them what, I just want them to know what aortic means. You know, you hear the term aortic, what exactly is that? Um, so the main vessel in your artery that, uh, the main artery that leaves the heart and the largest artery, uh, which you can see here in this model, uh, uh, basically supplies your entire body with blood uh, from branches that you will see here that are attenuated. Um, and uh, that um, uh, organ, sometimes that vessel sometimes can become diseased. And there's uh, uh, traditional ways of treating that and there's new ways of treating that. The newer ways of treating that are much less invasive. Patients that used to have to stay in the hospital uh, seven days to two weeks after an operation uh, now can go home the next day with some of the new advances. Uh, in treating um, uh, the aorta, and uh, this is especially uh, uh, this is expanded uh, treatment of these life-threatening diseases um, because uh, older patients tolerate these procedures much better than they did the traditional treatment. Thank you. 
So that sets up the program for today. There's a desire, there's, again, we can answer any questions you ask, but if, if you have one related to the specialties, that's always good. And uh, we'll see who's going to be the first one, because it may be a surprise gift for the first question. So, you just sit right here. Okay, right. can you do the mic so we can hear you on the TV? Just let's tell you. I'll try and cancel it. Why don't you tell us what you, your name, if you want, and where you're from? Yeah, yeah, stand up. Can you just turn it Ida? Yes. Okay, Nicolau. My question. Where are you from? I'm from New York. This area, Fox Slope, or another area? No, Bay Ridge. Bay Ridge. I always love to ask people like where they like to eat. You know, so in Bay Ridge, where do you like to eat? What's your favorite restaurant down there? In the restaurant? Yes. I mean, uh, most of the restaurants in Bay Ridge are good. Okay. We have Italian. We have Italian. So what's your top Italian? Top Italian restaurant? Uh, there's one uh, Anybody know? There's like a fourth there, but then arrows it down. Which one? Yeah, I forget the name. All right, anyway, let's maybe the question will be better than the restaurant portion. Right. Rocco's here. Oh, you run a restaurant still? Okay, Sally and George. I thought we moved on. And we have massage. Massage? Oh, I think she's okay, it's another story. Okay. Anyway, what about Tuscany Grill? Do you like Tuscany Grill? Yes. Nice little restaurant. Yes. Except the same special every time you go in there, they never change it. Okay. <laughs> All right, what can we do for you? Okay, I'm going to ask. Okay, you guys, but I want to hear what she has to say. I'm going to ask when my husband, he died from heart failure. Okay, so my husband had died from heart failure. Yes, and what I want to ask the uh, question, uh, I have also friends, they have the same problem now. And they are young, they uh -huh. are old, they have also heart failure. But mm -hmm. I want to know, I heard about in uh, Brazil or Venezuela, you know, they have a surgery for the heart, because the heart gets big and uh, So we're going to try and answer this. What can we do for heart failure? Some of the new techniques for heart failure with surgery. We saw it with um, the Vice President Cheney with these pump that's, I don't know if you've heard that in the news. Um, who would like to start off with this? What can we do for heart uh, failure? Uh, you want to start Amy with just a little heart failure? Uh, sure. I well, you know, congest congestive heart failure is a disease where the heart muscle is not able to pump enough blood around to the rest of the body. The heart is basically a pump. It fills, it pumps, it fills, it pumps. So in patients who have heart failure, the heart fills, but they can't pump whatever comes into it out. And so, so it backs up. And as a result of that, it backs up into their lungs, it backs up in, into their liver and their legs. Their legs swell up, their lungs swell up with water, they can't breathe. So there are certain strategies. The surgical strategies that you mentioned are to make the muscle of the heart more efficient. And you can do what's called a aneurysectomy if there's an aneurysmal dilatation or, or a stretched out part of the heart that isn't contracting, a scar tissue, there are surgical procedures to remove that scar tissue so that the heart pumps more uh, in unison and in synchronously. So uh, there's also other strategies like uh, atrioventricular synchronous pacemakers where they put a wire in the top of the heart and the bottom of the heart and they synchronize the electrical contraction of the heart so that it's much more efficient. Then we have drugs you know, which are very effective and do decrease mortality. There's several strategies that can be used now, and it depends on the individual. Congestive heart failure is not just one disease, it's actually several diseases. There's congestive heart failure due to valvular problems, and, and the treatment for somebody who has a bad valve, like a, a mitral stenosis or insufficiency or an aortic insufficiency, is to replace that valve once it reaches criteria for replacement. And if they have atherosclerotic heart disease or hardening of the arteries where the surface of the arteries of the heart are narrow, the treatment for that is to open up the arteries and then that will give more nutrition to the heart muscle and then the heart muscle will remodel over a period of time. So there are several strategies. Sometimes it's because the heart can't pump enough and that's called systolic heart failure or low ejection fraction heart failure where the heart can't pump enough. And then sometimes the heart is just stiff, it can't relax. 
And if the heart can't relax to pump, that's called diastolic heart failure. And the medications for each one are a little bit different. So um, we have those procedures here that you were mentioning, and it just depends on the particulars of the case. And I went to do, wait, I wouldn't, I wouldn't get to the really the surgical part yet, but Dr. Katsina, I just wanted to comment on some of the medications they might be taking for heart failure right now, and then we'll ask Dr. Zaman what kind of surgery can be done. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there is a number of medications that are used commonly in heart failure. Um, you know, one of the medication is uh, called beta blockers. So I'm sure people who have uh, that condition are familiar with that. It's something like uh, carvedilol, metoprolol, and you know the medications of that kind. Uh, another medication is uh, it's called ACE inhibitor. So it's just I think the purpose of those medications affect um, the different pathways that um, will make you know will make your heart stronger. So there is another medication that is called aldactone or spironolactone, and uh, um, uh, so the next medicine is something that is uh, commonly known by the name of a water pill, and that what uh, that water pill does is just remove the fluid out of the lungs or out of the legs or in the liver. But on, uh, you know the what what is very important is that you'll have to for somebody who taking that medication stay on the regimen. Uh, take the medication religiously, closely follow up with the doctors, and uh, in case if you notice any uh, side effects or any complications, you have to uh, get in touch with your doctor as soon as possible. Thank you. And now, Dr. Zaman, if you could just briefly t t comment on the surgery that was asked yeah. about. Uh, first, I'd like to say that uh, the primary management on most of these conditions is medical. Uh, surgery is reserved for a very small portion, a uh, very small subset of patients that actually uh, uh, qualify. And there's multiple factors that go into whether that patient is a candidate for surgery or not. Uh, those, that's a much more in-depth conversation is beyond the scope of, uh, of uh, this panel. Uh, but there are uh, several methods, uh, surgical. The most commonly employed is for valvular defects and correction of the valves. Um, other techniques, uh, some are experimental uh, as the, uh, and uh, have not truly been uh, proven in all cases and uh, the indications for those uh, uh, such as ventricular assist devices uh, which have been approved by the FDA are for uh, a limited set of patients. Thank you. So I hope that answered your question. Would he, would he have been better, you know, if this had been available? They will get it from their family or it's not necessary? Yeah, I mean, I think um, it's, I mean, you want to just yeah, it's, it's unlikely that the, the family will get it. Heart disease can be familial, but that is high cholesterol is familial. And, and in certain cases, premature heart disease before the age of 50, that those kinds of patients tend to be hereditary, uh, but for the most part, the, the most common cause of death in the United States is heart disease, so pretty much we're all at risk for heart disease, so I don't think uh, that your children in particular are any more, but they are certainly, uh, you know, with family history being a risk factor, a very strong risk factor, they, they are at risk. Thank you. So, actually, for being the first caller, is to, you're going to get this beautiful mug, so ask the doctor on the back. So. I'm going to keep it up here because we're going to have one more trivia question. Mm -hmm. And before we get to the next question, what's the shortest stop on the train lines? Any train line, this, this, the shortest distance between one stop and another. And uh, you, could, you, you raise your hands when you know it. You know mm -hmm. I'm not going to tell you the line it's on, but it's... Nine, nine, three, 15th and 9th. 15th and 9th, no, I'm sorry. There's a shorter one, shorter one. That's a good one. Do you have a guess? 47? No, I'm going to give you a hint. I've got to give a hint to this one. It's in Brooklyn. It's in Brooklyn, New York. These are all short. These are all short things, but... Um, what stop is that? Oh, to Smith Street. No, no, but it is a short stop, too. At the R train? No, it's not in the R. Remember what the name of the R was before the R? Uh, All right. Yeah, I don't know why they did away with that. But anyway, so let's take another question and then we'll give some hints. Yes, in the back, please. Uh, 
My name is Jim Curry. I'm from Asker, Queens. My wife Pat and I got to go on and we watch a show every Tuesday night. So. Thank you. If you want to know a good restaurant in Nashville? Yes. Uh, three Sons on 61st Street. Nice Italian. Three restaurant. Sons. I'm not. From, anyone else familiar with Three Sons? Near the library. Near the library. I have to drive it. I'm an Italian. Yeah. Beautiful. Uh, as we all know, the biggest issue in the country today is health care, the cost of health care. Uh -huh. And my concern right now, which I'd like the doctors to talk about a little bit, is the difference between generic and brand name, brand name drugs. Uh -huh. uh, specifically, in my case, <clears throat> my situation is I'm taking Crestor now. Uh -huh. And my union doesn't want to pay for it anymore. They say that I can get a generic uh, right. statin drug, I believe they call it statin drug. Right, right. Um, it's, a good it's a good question because sure. everybody's being faced with this right now. Uh, are generic goods as good as the regular <coughs> brand name drugs? Right. Well, generic drugs are drugs that are kind of no frills drugs like you would get in a store where something that you buy in a grocery store, no frills napkins instead of uh, brand name napkins and things like that. Um, many of the generic brands are made by the brand companies themselves. Uh, some of them aren't. In something like a, a drug for cholesterol, Crestor, as you know, is a drug to control cholesterol. And um, Crestor actually is a statin. But there are older statins, which are now cheaper. And the older statins are drugs like Zocor. Zocor is a, one of the first statins, and that's called Simvastatin. It's much, much cheaper than is Crestor. Um, you can actually tell if the drug is effective or not because with something like cholesterol, it's easily measurable. You can, if the drug has changed, in a month or two, the blood can be drawn and you can actually see if it has worked or not. But some patients will have uh, more or, or less side effects on one drug from the other, even if it's a brand or a generic. I would say in general, there's no difference. There are certain situations where they are different. Uh, I always cite this case of Bar Pharmaceuticals when they put a generic diazide out on the market. And what they did in order for themselves to get approved, they took the brand diazide and submitted it to the FDA and said, this is our drug. We are producing this drug. And then the FDA said, wow, you're producing great quality diazide. Go right ahead and produce the diazide. And it turned out years later that they had actually perpetrated a fraud upon the government that it wasn't really their diazide that was approved. So I think, um, in general, there are, there's no differences. Often what will happen is, after 18 years, when a drug is branded, the government will give anybody rights to produce the drug. And at that point, many different small pharmaceutical houses produce the drug in order to make a profit. What the brand companies do in those situations is they usually underprice the generic companies and put them out of business, and they produce the generics themselves you know, as to eliminate competition. They feel like a small part of the market is better than no part of the market. So many of the generics are made by the brand companies themselves. But in general, there shouldn't be any differences, but you have to follow up and make sure it's effective. It's, if it's a generic high blood pressure medicine, follow up with your blood pressure to see if it's effective or not, you know, will be fairly obvious. And Crestor is one of those drugs where it would be fairly obvious if, it, if the change in the drug worked or not. Thank you. You know, what's interesting is that when the Tylenol recall, the Motrin recall, Benadryl recall were all brand name at, a, at, at um, Tylenol's factory, whereas the generic ones did not have the same flaws, the same debris, the little metal filings in them and so on. So sometimes the generic can actually be better. As, as Dr. Backer said, there may be instances where your doctor wants you to take the, the brand name, whether it's maybe cancer drugs, a certain kind of rare heart medication you're taking. So for, it, I think the general answer is, yeah, brand, uh, generic is the best way to go. But always ask your doctor just to make sure. From what I understand, it's uh, when a new drug comes out, it's under patent for five years, and then after the five years, any company can make. But the chemical composition of the drug is basically exactly the same, right? Yeah. Yes. So, so I think you're making the right decision. Why is such a great difference in price? Well, they say they paid a lot of money to research and develop the product. You know, there was a lot of false starts, a lot of money went into it, and this is their way to recoup that money, which is why they get the five years or whatever they're given, to try and get it back. Afterwards, they, the government feels you've made back that money, that investment, so now you can start to offer it at a competitive price. Thanks for coming from Aspen. Thank you. Who else do we have? I'll have a question down front. You're next. Yes. I have a question. Um, I'm a 
I have a question about Plavix. Okay. I take Plavix with aspirin. But when I go to the dentist, he tell me I have to stop it. My heart doctor say you cannot stop it because you have Plavix. Should you take, should you stop taking so Plavix? what should I do? Right, should, should she stop taking Plavix when she goes to the dentist? Mm -hmm. In, you know, the, the answer is different. It, it depends on what condition you're taking the Plavix for. And uh, I guess if uh, you're seeing the cardiologist, so there is a cardiac problem. There are certain conditions that uh, you absolutely must continue taking aspirin and Plavix. And uh, uh, you discuss with your dentist, or maybe the dentist will have to speak to the cardiologist. Now, it depends what kind of procedure is dentist is going to be doing. Let's say if it's uh, something, um, you know, something minor, or maybe it's just simple tooth extraction. It is possible to be done uh, uh, while you are aspirin and Plavix. It's just probably more difficult for the dentist because more attention will have to be um, paid to the, um, his uh, um, ability to stop the bleeding. Of course, there is a concern if you're doing something major. Maybe you do some kind of a gum operation. So that's why at that point, you'll have to uh, you know, speak to a cardiologist and a dentist to decide what you're gonna do, what is more, uh, more urgent. For you to stay in aspirin and Plavix to prevent a uh, recurrent heart attack, for instance. Or, and do the gum surgery or any extensive procedure a little bit later, when it's going to be um, possible to hold the aspirin and Plavix. Thank you. I know Dr. Bakesh was excited about a new medication that may replace Coumadin. Has anybody taken Coumadin out there? Right, so people are taking Coumadin, maybe for atrial fibrillation, for other conditions. Dr. Bakesh, what about uh, this sure. exciting new uh, Sure, there's actually a new drug out that's FDA approved. It's actually can be prescribed by your doctor should he feel it's necessary. It's indicated for a non-valvular atrial fibrillation. Atrial, fibr atrial fibrillation is an arrhythmia when your heart is irregular, it beats uh, irregularly. Um, and n normally in a case like that, we use a drug called warfarin now, or Coumadin, which is a tricky drug. It's a drug in which you have to take and have your bloods drawn on a regular basis in order to determine whether or not you're on too much or too little, if your blood is too thin or too thick. Because if you take too much Coumadin, you'll bleed, and if you take too little, it doesn't work. So these are drugs that have what we call a low therapeutic index. It means that the dose that works for the disease is very close to the toxic dose that can poison you. And these are tricky drugs. There's a few drugs like that in medicine, and warfarin or Coumadin is like that. So warfarin and Coumadin are, are not drugs that doctors like to prescribe and patients don't like to take because then they gotta go to the lab all the time. It's a real pain in the neck. So a new drug is out now called Pradexa, P-R-A-D-A-X-A. And it's a drug that's taken twice a day. It does the same thing as warfarin. It thins your blood out. It's used for non-valvular atrial fibrillation, but you don't have to have any blood tests done. So you don't have to go every week or every month to have a blood test done. It has the same exact side effects as Coumadin. If you have an ulcer, it'll make you bleed. If you have liver disease, it can make you bleed. But the only advantage is, is that you don't have to go to the lab and have your blood test done, which is a real big advantage. Okay. <laughs> right back there, yes. What's your name, please? George Payata. And where are you from? Brooklyn North. Which part? Bailey. So do you agree? Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure what the answer was. Yeah. What was the answer? Yes, it's my neighbor. Well, you're oh, neighbor. Okay. But with the restaurant she gave? No. We visit the restaurant sometimes. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. So what can we do for you? Well, my question is, I've been diabetic for over six years. And I'm still on medication. I take uh, high blood pressure medication, baby car, 10 milligrams every day. And besides, I take Lipitor, 10 grams every day. But my pulse is always between 90 and 110, hmm. most of the time. And the uh, French doctor told me I should be, be taking a beta blocker. But my primary doctor refused to, you know, to prescribe it for me. So what do you advise me to do? The other thing I need to know if my, all my blood taste was good, always good. Uh, is there any chance for me to have any heart problems in the future? Mm -hmm. okay, so we got a number of diabetic, and he wants to know if he should be on beta blocker, and if he keeps his his numbers well, like the glucose and the hemoglobin test, will that mean that he won't get heart disease? It's a good question. So yeah, see. Uh -huh, I see. So I, I just wanted to clarify. The question was: Is that uh, do you have to take the beta blocker? To, uh, what, to prevent the heart disease? 
No, yeah. he, he's not going to take it. Your, what, your, your pulse is very nice. Okay, how high is the pulse? Between 90 and 105, 110. I see. Okay. So, you know, in addition to that you have to control your, make sure that your blood pressure is uh, less than 130 over 80 and your sugars are controlled, your cholesterol is, uh, your bad cholesterol is less than 100, right? This is what we do for people for diabetes. Uh, now, usually is, uh, first of all, we have to find out what's causing your elevated heart rate, increased heart rate. Because uh, having the heart rate between 90 and 100 or 90 and 110 is not normal. So you're, you can speak to your doctor and ask him, maybe you can check your thyroid hormone. Maybe there is something else that's causing the elevated heart rate. But the overall is uh, when somebody has increased heart rate for a certain period of time, it actually may uh, weaken your heart. So please speak to your doctor again, address your concerns, ask him to, you know, what he thinks is causing the problem. And depending on what you decide to do is, he can, he will be able to prescribe the better blocker for you, mm -hmm. if needed. Uh, sure. Well, yeah, the drugs you're on seem very appropriate. Benicar is a uh, ARB or an angiotensin rev uh, receptor blocker, which really decreases your chance of getting renal failure and heart disease from the diabetes. Lipitor, as you know, is a statin similar to Crestor, and that also decreases your cholesterol and hopefully will decrease your chance of getting heart disease. Ninety-five percent of diabetics die from heart disease, so that is why we treat diabetes aggressively, and that's why we want to keep the diabetes under good control. Because basically, if the sugar is high, it causes an accelerated aging process. It makes your blood vessels age much quicker. And so you could have a 50-year-old guy who has our, uh, blood vessels like a 70-year-old guy. So when it's normal, your sugars are normal, that doesn't happen. High resting pulse can be due to something simply as just being deconditioned. If you're somebody who does not exercise, at all, um, it wouldn't be unusual for you to have a high resting heart rate. The people with the lowest heart rates are bicyclists. Piece of, people who ride bicycles have the slowest heart rates. They can get their heart rates down to 30. And basically that's because every time their heart pumps, they pump a larger mm -hmm. amount of blood. So if you have to pump six quarts of blood per minute, and to do that you have to beat, you have to contract 100 times, you're not pumping as much each time. But if you can get your heart to pump much more vigorously and stronger, if you lower your heart rate down to 60, it's being much more efficient. And the way you do that is by exercise. And I, I do agree that you know, there's certain strategies to determine what the cause is, including stress testing. But if, if, your, if your heart doctor says he doesn't want to prescribe beta blockers, and I can understand why, in a sense, because beta blockers mask low blood sugar. So if you give beta blockers to a diabetic and their blood sugar drops, they don't get the sweating, they don't get the palpitations, they don't get those symptoms just before they pass out. So if you leave someone on a beta blocker who is susceptible to low blood sugar reactions from diabetes, they could pass out much more likely than someone who's not. And that may be his reason. So we're going to take a short break, we're going to take a short break, but uh, I just wanted to, the training question is either on the B or the um, Q line. Just a little hint. B or the Q line? Mm. B. B is correct. <laughs> what is it? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's bingo over here. Yelled at bingo. I don't know. No. I remember the stop. I'll tell you the stop right now. It's between Kentucky Road and Beverly Road. And it's the shortest stop in the whole system. So we, we still have another one. I'm going to give one more before we go to the break. 40 years ago, this restaurant was the largest restaurant in the world in the Guinness Book of Records, serving 1,800 meals at a time. Just think about that. It's in Brooklyn, New York. If anybody can think. Seniors? No, it's good. Juniors, you're not a good guess. Lundy's. Lundy's in the back. You can see it wasn't worth the trip. You're going to get one of these. Okay. So we'll take a quick break, and then Dr. Zaman is going to tell us a little bit about this peculiar looking thing over here, okay? Okay, we'll be right back. Thank you. I'm Dr. Steve Garner, the host of Ask the Doctor. In addition to watching Ask the Doctor every Tuesday night at 8, you can also visit www.netny.net slash askthedoctor. There you can find the topics and guests of each episode. You can read my column from the week for the tablet, and for more advice, you can watch episodes you've missed. More importantly, you can post your questions and I'll answer them on the video blog. 
So visit www.netny.net slash Ask the Doctor and get your daily dose of healthy advice. So I, I just want to, before you start, we we'll get back to some of the questions. Tara Sierra, producer, remind me, please sign up. Please sign up for the show. Remember this. What do we got? And I would like to ask the doctor about that. Wait, 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 can I have, just, um, this is not you, we have the, you've worked with medical records? Yes, of course. Okay, it may take a while to review those, but, um, did you? I love the carotid and the, here, let's say, here. I feel like I'm Judge Judy here. I have a doc, and I have 50% I don't Okay, Dr. Zaman is going to answer this. It has to do with, has anybody here had a Doppler or a sound wave test of the carotid arteries in the neck where they put jelly on it and then they took sound wave? It's a very important test because it could help to prevent strokes. Because the first sign of a stroke is a stroke usually. But you can tell by looking at the carotid arteries if there's a lot of buildup. It's a non-invasive test that doesn't hurt and you do it by sound wave. So wait, I'm going to ask in general. He's going to talk in general. Stroke is one of the major causes of uh, death and disability in this country. Uh, and approximately, uh, approximately 25% uh, of strokes are caused by carotid disease, um, uh, which is uh, one of the things I deal with. Um, uh, one of the screening tests that is done for people that, that are at high risk, people that either have a smoking history uh, or uh, elderly, uh, have high cholesterol, or uh, have high blood pressure, diabetes, uh, risk factors for what is called atherosclerosis or hardening of the arteries. Uh, one of the tests that's done for them is a screening duplex. And that's basically an ultrasound of the neck that looks at the velocities within the neck uh, and within the arteries that feed the brain. Um, and this is done just to see if you have any carotid disease. Uh, sir, you'll be happy to know that you don't have any significant disease, nothing that would warrant intervention other than the medications that you take. So uh, for carotid disease, there's essentially three options. <coughs> One is risk factor modification, which is uh, essentially taking your diabetic medications, taking your uh, cholesterol medications, taking your blood pressure medications, taking all the medications that decrease your risk factors. Um, the, the other is that uh, you can have, uh, if, if uh, it's indicated, you can have uh, a surgery to clean the plaque out if the plaque is significant enough or if it's symptomatic. The other is possible stenting, which is uh, uh, done on individual basis after uh, uh, analysis of which three options are the best. Um, uh, in, in your case, are you on any cholesterol medications? No. But uh, your cholesterol looks like it's relatively uh, controlled. And you don't need anything right now. All right? Well, congratulations. No one's going to bring me up to colonoscopy, are they? No, please. Please don't. <laughs> Yes. What's your name, please? My name is Louise Major. I had a question a few months ago, and fortunately, Dr. Bakash was able to on answer. The, on the show? <laughs> In his office. Okay. I always had a terrible digestive problem, uh -huh. and laxatives and whatnot, and he started me on Miralax, and I can't begin to tell you, it's just worked wonders, and mm -hmm. anyone else in the audience that may, possibly, other people smiling there. <laughs> that may so. possibly have this uh, digestive problem. And yes. I was a little concerned because I told Dr. Bakesh on the jar or packet, whatever you want to call it, it says you can't take it beyond seven days. And Dr. Bakesh says, no, 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 you don't have to worry. You could almost take it forever. And I find that I've gained a tremendous amount of strength Beautiful. after taking the Miralax. Thanks to Dr. Thank Bakash. Dr. Bakash is on this Tuesday night. If you want to watch, she's one of the guests. Tuesday night at 8. Remember what channel? 97. 97, 97. 97 is Time Warner. 
30, but watch the time warning, 98, you know what, play, Playboy, Playboy Channel 98, so be careful. <laughs> yeah. Last year you told me that DirecTV will be getting it. Yes. But you still have the I told you you are going to have a mic also. Yes. Please, please. My name is Yadvita Douglas. Yes. I live in Kensington. Kensington. Is there any restaurant? There is no real restaurant in Kensington. There are no restaurants there, and I'm not restaurant restaurantgoer, so I can... Did you go to the new Greek place, Okinawas, here, Oke Okeanos? Isn't that a night, a night there? If you, if you mention you called the show, yeah. we're going to say hello to you. Yeah. I don't know if there's anything else. Hey, for some night, say you're going to bottle the wine, glass of wine, all right? See what happens. Okay. So, uh, I had uh, uh, quite a lot of experience with uh, the Greek restaurant. Yes. Okay. Uh, and I was taking all these years uh, 150 micrograms of uh, central. Uh -huh. because I think the patient knows his or her body best and you, usually the patient says something's not right. A lot of times you get someone coming, I don't feel right, something's not, and it's very important to listen to it. So Dr. Kassin, what do you think about it? And I lost... Yeah, let's see what she says because... Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I just feel that I feel better when I'm taking more than I mentioned to the doctor several times and said, no, the test shows you are okay. My sister had the surgery just a few months ago to remove her thyroid and she also did 75. My question is, is the, is the rule that if you don't have thyroid at 75 mm -hmm. or every patient should have a different Anybody else on thyroid medication in here? Yes. Okay. So. No, I think everyone is, uh, everyone is different. Uh, some people require 25. Some 75, some 175. So it's all measured. What usually happens is the doctor orders the special thyroid test. And depending on the results of the test, that thyroid medicine is being adjusted. You know, the symptoms that you've been describing is, are very characteristic for the low thyroid function. And uh, it coincided with the decreasing of your thyroid medication. So, you, you know, what I think is if it's consistently, if you're consistently feeling the symptoms and your doctor is insisting that your um, blood work is good, maybe you can speak to, ask your doctor, maybe use another lab. <laughs> Send your blood to another lab. Maybe there is some kind of, a, you know, lab error. Uh, another question I have is just blood testing. <clears throat> They check your thyroid hormone, and uh, there is a couple, you know, number of confirmatory tests that your doctor can use. But again, if you, if he or she keeps telling you that your numbers are good, ask him, and you do have symptoms of the low thyroid function, ask him to um, send your blood work to the different lab and see what it is. And also, it may be, uh, you know, the medication that you're taking. What, what can also affect your uh, thyroid absor is the absorption of the drug. So th the thyroid medication has to be taken on an empty stomach. And it cannot be taken with any other medication. It has to be done at least an hour before you eat, preferably longer than that. So you'll get better absorption. Also, in decreasing the dose of a drug in a patient with thyroid disease, it's very important not to draw the blood that frequently. So it takes about six weeks after the dose change to steady state. So if I lower your dose from 150 to 125, I should wait at least six weeks before I change the drug again. And uh, the reason why he doesn't want to give you too much 
and, and, and make you overactive or hyper is because high levels of thyroid medication increase your risk of osteoporosis in, in your body and fracture. And that's, that's you know, a, big, a big concern. So you know, that, that may be why. Okay. Any other question right now? Yeah. Oh wait, 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 wait. Yes. Uh, can you come? Can you come up here so we can get your uh, sure. your name, please? My name is Grace Paragon, and I'm from Brooklyn, New York, um, Williamsburg. Oh, what's happening, Williamsburg? Right, a tremendous number of new restaurants, right? Yeah. What, what can you recommend for us? Tony's restaurant. Tony's. Tony's on Drake Avenue. Okay, Tony's. On very nice. What's the? Is, is it Say? What's the one now? Say. Yeah. Excuse me. Restaurant called Say. No. S E C. C no, no, okay. C. C, if you're a C, is that any? Pretty good. That's, that's another one, SCA, yeah. yeah, okay. What can we do for you? Well, I have a 17 year old daughter that was recently taken to the emergency room and she was diagnosed with acid reflux and her blood pressure was elevated and she also has a heart rate since she was a baby. And I was just wondering if you could tell me what types of food that she should stay away from to prevent that from happening. Yeah, sure. So again, just those in it, acid reflux. Yes. She had a heart murmur, which is probably nothing to, to worry yeah. about. But this reflux, what type of food to stay away from getting this heartburn, this regurgitation? Yeah, the, the foods that increase reflux are carbonated beverages, things like seltzer and sodas, fatty foods like fried foods, cheese, things, things like that, coffee, caffeine, chocolate. The things they put on your pillow in a hotel, those mint chocolates, are the absolute worst thing in the world to take <laughs> before you go to bed because it's just like, it's milk chocolate is made out of cream and fat. So she's got to avoid chocolate, cheese, fried foods, carbonated beverages, things like uh, whole milk actually can make it worse, but skim milk would be better because there's fat in milk. So, and uh, what you have to do is not eat and lie down for two to three hours. And so if you eat dinner, you can't lie down for another two or three hours. It takes at least a couple of hours for your stomach to empty completely. Can she have tomato sauce? Well, I think when, when it comes down to that, although tomato sauce is a little acidic, it's really not that acidic. It will bother some people and not others. So if you have a very large meal and you have uh, even a little bit more acid than you would normally have and it refluxes, it might bother her. So um, if it's fatty, you know, the thing is, I don't think it's so much the tomato juice or sauce, it's the, the, the oil in the sauce. Uh, it's I, the fat. I really don't cook with oil with my tomatoes. Well, it shouldn't, it, it shouldn't bother her, but things like raw onions could bother somebody with reflux also. Okay. Then I have one other question. Oh, no, I, I, because we're running out of time, but we can answer it after the show ends. Okay. okay? Thank you. I, I just wanted Dr. Zaman, before we go to our final break, which will be the end of the show, basically, we have to, we're going to hear from Dr. Zaman, because he carried this thing in here. And <laughs> what, what do you say about this? Well, uh, just uh, uh, as I alluded to earlier, as I alluded to earlier in the show, uh, you know, we have new techniques of treating aortic disease, and we do have uh, the new aortic center at, at New York uh, Methodist Hospital. Yeah. Uh, just, uh, just to give you an idea of uh, how we used to treat this disease, we used to uh, require either large incisions within the chest, the abdomen, or the chest and abdomen. And probably one of the most uh, significant uh, operations uh, one could undergo, uh, um, you know. So uh, we, with the new techniques, we actually can, through small incisions within the groin, incisions approximately uh, this big, you can actually go ahead and deploy with devices such as this. You can track this into the aorta and actually fix aneurysms, such as the one displayed right here in the aorta. Uh, where this an aneurysm is a, a ballooning of the normal aorta, which can cause a lot of problems. It can burst and uh, is associated with a high uh, mortality. Uh, common. Um, so, uh, with these new devices, you know we can repair very very sick people uh, with much lower, uh, with half the incidence of uh, complications or uh, mortality. Thank you. Thank you. So, right. that, that really is, um, and you know, you may not think you need it now. A lot of times these are picked up incidentally. We go on for one test and we find an aneurysm. The Holbrook was died in Washington. The ambassador to, I think, Afghanistan died of an aneurysm or a rush. No, but after the show, after the show, because I. But what, to what
Synthroid is a synthroid is levothyroxine. It's a, it's a, th a thyroid replacement therapy. It actually, uh, when you have a goiter and it's removed, there's no longer a thyroid gland to produce the hormone. And synthroid is identical to the hormone that you would have produced, so it's replacing it. It's a thyroid replacement. If they don't remove it, they give you the thyroid uh, medicine by mouth when your gland is not making it itself. Hypothyroidism is usually when the gland itself is not producing any more thyroid hormone. So you take it externally, and that replaces the thyroid hormone you should have been making yourself. I want to thank everybody for coming. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's our first um, experiment with this, and we'll buy out some of the kinks later. I want to remind you about this again. There's try and join up because you'll uh, you'll enjoy that, and also you'll find out about what's going on by Catholic TV and, and the boroughs. So it's a nice station. You can have cooking shows. They have um, historical shows. You're going to like it. So again, if you want to watch this show, it's going to be on shortly. But Tuesday night at 8 o'clock, there's a brand new show. We'll be talking about this show with Dr. Backhash. And um, we'll, we'll be around at the end to say hello to anybody that wants to. Uh, I will two people there. Thank you. Thank you.